Dubravka Schwitzer. Since uh, 2019, she is the vice president and commissioner. She's a Croatian politician from the beautiful city of Dubrovnik, where she served as the first female mayor and was awarded in 2006 the World Mayor Award. She entered politics in the 1990s um, for the Croatian Democratic Union. And she was for 10 years also president of the Croatian delegation to the Congress of Local Regional Authorities of the Council of Europe. From 2013 to 2019, Dubravka Schwitzer served as a member of the European Parliament. And in June 2019, she was also elected as the vice chair of the EPP group in the European Parliament. Thank you very much for joining us in Brussels. I would also like to welcome Nikola Dimitrov. He's uh, the Deputy Minister for European Integration of North Macedonia. And uh, he served as the Minister of Foreign Affairs from 2017 until this summer. He studied in Skopje and in Cambridge and specialist there in international law. He started his career at the Minister of Foreign Affairs in 1996 as a human rights lawyer. And he was also ambassador to the United States and the Netherlands. He's a former member of the Balkans in Europe a Policy Advisory Group. And he was involved in diplomatic efforts for the name dispute with Greece for many years. In 2018, with his Greek counterpart, Nikos Kotsias, he signed then the PRESPA agreements to solve the name dispute, and as a result of this agreement, his country changed its name to North Macedonia. Thank you so much, Minister Dimitrov, for joining us. Yeah, you know already Minister of State for Europe, Michael Roth. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us here in this evening. He is also, as a Minister of State for Europe, he's also responsible for the West Balkans. Yeah, my name is Adelheid Wölf. I'm a correspondent for Southeastern Europe for the Austrian um, daily Der Standard, and I'm based in Sarajevo. And I'm now very pleased to introduce to all of you a group of six very committed young people from uh, the six Western Balkan states. They spent a long journey together, meeting since 13 weeks via Zoom, on a weekly basis and then even more often. Although they've never met in person, they developed trust and very good relations. They all have a professional background in academics, politics, civil society and business. And I had the pleasure to meet them yesterday online. And they all told me that their cooperation in the past weeks gave them a lot of courage and confidence to continue with their work and to focus on regional cooperation. In this sense, this group of these young people is not only a sign of hope, but also a signal that trust will prevail over fear in the region. And what is all linking them, I had the impression, is that they prefer connections to barriers. These six young people are full of energy and dedication to tackle the current challenges in the Western Balkans. In the past weeks, they dealt with brain drain, with functional illiteracy, youth unemployment, the lack of student exchange within the region, rising authoritarianism, bilateral conflicts, and environmental pollution. But they did not stop in only analyzing these problems, but focused in developing strategies and very concrete proposal, policy proposals. When I talked to them yesterday, they agreed that it was most important for them to look for solutions and to write them down. So they wrote a, a report called Seven Ideas for Prosperous Western Balkans, which I highly recommend to read. And in this report, they ask for a reform of the regional education system, especially preschool education, increased regional mobility schemes for the exchange of students, but also for vocational training, 
the demands that Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo sh should ultimately allow visa-free traveling. They want to bring down air pollution, from, especially from coal plants. They consider it as necessary to invest in infrastructure, in digital transformation, but also in the establishment of civic education centers in order to foster young, the young and often labor democracies in the region. And finally, the demand that the Western Balkan states should be included in the Conference on the Future of Europe. From what I have understood, they had also a lot of fun together and they faced political conference, conflicts with humor. They realized that they have different approaches, but most important, they became really friends, no matter from which country, ethnicity, language. At the end, we were spending more time together than with our families, one of them told me. When talking to them, I could see the readiness and the preparedness of them to actively get involved. Samia Beharic, for instance, told me that they are aware that they have to join institutions in order to achieve systematic ch change, and they are ready to do that. They know that nobody is waiting or asking them, but they have to do it on their own. Their message to the politicians is, if there's political will from your side, you have already, already partners here on the ground, we are ready. But the best message is, and in that they all agreed when we talked, is the friendship they built. Let us listen now to their arguments, to their proposals on their, and their deliberations. And they will also ask, because this should be a, a dialogue, a debate, um, questions to the politician. I first want to introduce Majola Memai from Albania. She has a master, a degree of Master of Science in Political Science and International Relations from Portugal. She was a co-founder and former regional representative of the Western Balkans Association. And she's a youth activist and very experienced in the field of EU integration. Currently, she's working in the field of communication and policy support with Eurofood information. Thank you so much for being here, Mrs. Memai. And I'm kindly asking you now to talk about your motivation and your topic, civic education and democratization, please. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Uh, good evening. Uh, uh, I'm currently addressing you from uh, Tirana in Albania, and I'm very thankful to be part of this uh, conference, but mostly I'm very happy that I witness personally the commitment of the organizers of this conference in having youth voice from the region be part of the table, especially in addressing and discussing a very important issue for our future. On a personal note, for the last five years, I have experienced migration in various for of its forms, uh, being this for short and even a long term. So, uh, as mentioned previously, for my education, I, I studied between Netherlands and Portugal, and I had various tra uh, training in Germany, Italy, Spain, but uh, also for the last two years, I've been working between Romania and Albania and currently working for Brussels. So if you, if you can see from them, uh, I have lived and I'm living with one foot in you and the other one in Albania in my country, but also in the region. So, but for me personally, it's always, and it's always have been about both, uh, both sides of it, both staying and leaving. And uh, especially having the opportunity and the freedom to choose so, which is very, very important. Uh, in 2018, I had the opportunity to attend a workshop at the Gustav Stressmann Institute, a nonprofit institution for, uh, of civic and political education in Bonn, Germany. There, people came together to learn about shaping democracy and society, and they expressed their thoughts and experiences. I was very inspired by their story and especially their, the, the history of that institution and especially their mission in strengthening political and social uh, responsibility uh, of its citizens. Now, living in a different reality even in Albania and in the region where uh, people and young people leave the country because they believe that nothing will change when we fight constantly apathy and we strive for more, more youth participation, 
it was very clear and obvious to me on how much we needed this kind of uh, this kind of practices in uh, in our countries especially having an example where democracy represented a dialogue um, a discussion and a deliberative process in which citizens engage now migration in our countries i believe is not just the cause but merely the symptom of other underlying problems of the region's governments uh, one of them to be mentioned, and I'm sure my colleagues would, uh, would have other very important points, but one that I wanted to address is the structural weakness of our democratic institution that, as we can see, has kept the countries, our countries, far off from exerting the, a good governance. Now, on the other hand, civic education, as a very important element of democracy, uh, has not very well been integrated in our education system in our countries. So young people and citizens have lacked the, the right information on what civic engagement uh, means and mostly how do we practice it. Um, now, citizen participation uh, in a democratic society, uh, we know must be based on an informed and critical reflection, but it's very important as well to, to be understood and accepted uh, the rights and also the responsibility that comes with it as well. Uh, democracy, is, as I see it, needs to be experienced and debated in, in daily lives of the citizens. Now, in, in, in Albania and in the Balkan, for sure, we do not have a problem discussing about politics. That's actually that's the most uh, discussed topic that we have every day. Uh, we spend hours debating and discussing our country's future and especially our political system and, and criticizing constantly and especially what we wanted to, to be changed. And that is always in our daily, everyday life discussing in, in, in coffee shops. So, but that is the place when we sincerely express uh, our ideas about the future and especially the democratic process in our everyday reality. Now, what is missing and I believe in our countries is exactly the right orientation and information on how to direct this discussion to influence public policy reforms. I do truly believe that democracy can only thrive on the participation of informed citizens. And especially inspired by my trip and one week trip in, in Germany and inspired by the role of the uh, civic educational centers, uh, the recommendation that I wanted to share today in this first day of the conference, but especially in this panel, was, was establishing this regional network of uh, six civic education centers. They will be independent and they will provide citizens with the information about all areas of, of politics. Uh, but this is without being tainted by governments or even, even political parties. And will provide them the right space to discuss uh, issues and especially the development of democracy and European integration. And I believe that that all can be translated later on in a better public policies, but especially strengthen the links uh, between people and the institution that serves them. Now, following a bit naturally the narrative of this idea, uh, my, my question is more directed to Mrs. Shritza. Uh, and, and my question would be uh, in, this, in this idea, would the European Commission be ready now in the light of its commitment to improve citizens' participation in EU democracy to support the development and, and work of these uh, centers for civic education in the Western Balkan region? Thank you. like now to introduce uh, to you um, Nenad Jevtovic from Serbia. He is director of the Institute for Development and Innovation, which last year analyzed the regional costs of youth emigration. And he's an economist and member of the coordination body for monitoring flows of economic migration at the Serbian Ministry of Labor. And he will now uh, talk about the economic benefit of population migration from the Western Balkans. Please, Mr. Jeftovic. Okay. Can you hear me? 
Can you hear me? I can hear you. Hello to Belgrade. Okay. <laughs> All the best from Belgrade and thank you very much for this opportunity. My name is Nena Djertovic and I'm director of the Institute for Development and Innovation from Belgrade, Serbia. Uh, with my colleagues from Institute, I uh, prepare research study into the cost of youth emigration, the first of its kind to provide evidence about Serbian migration and to answer one simple question. How much does youth emigration cost Serbia? After that, we have prepared studies, cost of youth emigration for North Macedonia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro and Albania. The most important benefit of the immigration flow is the remittances. Remittances are the money transferred by immigrant, immigrants to the people close to them who remain in the home country. Their income improves the life quality of the recipients, but it's also considerably influenced the Serbian economy and economies of other Western Balkan countries. The remittances are very important for our countries. An examination of the allocation structure, I want to underline allocation structure of transferred amounts leads to the conclusion that these funds play an important role in the national economy. But they, they cannot be seen as a generator for future development or further growth while the investment component is too low. Really, very, very, very low. Also, there are warning signs that this finance source will start to decrease due to changes in the form of migration in the future, in which currently the migration of entire families dominates from Serbia and other Western Balkan countries. Another reason is to uh, generational change in the migrant population. In line with that, uh, I have a question for uh, dear Mr. Dimitrov. Uh, Mr. Dimitrov, as you can see, I'm very much interested in how the money that our diaspora is sending back home can be used in a more strategic and long-term need to turn this money into investments so that they work as a generator for our future development. As someone who has long experience in convincing both domestic and foreign audience, and as someone who knows politicians and political situation in the region very well, what would you advise me? Where should I start and how? Thank you very much and uh, all the best from Belgrade. Thank you, Mr. Jevtovic. Thanks a lot for your proposal and the question. We will first uh, go to the first question to Commissioner Schulze. Um, yeah, the, centers, the, the Center for Civic Education, would you uh, support this idea to to improve the citizen participation in the Western Balkan by developing such centers. Please, Mrs. Schwitzer. We cannot, unfortunately, we cannot hear you. We cannot hear you. Unfortunately, we cannot hear you. Could you please turn on the button? Yes, yes now. now now I'm unmuted, but you, you, you allowed me to unmute now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, so first I would like to thank Mariola uh, from Albania for her uh, introduction and for her, for her question. And uh, I fully agree that we need to encourage and engage in civic engagement and uh, active democratic participation. This is definite and uh, I don't know that anyone can oppose this. Uh, this is a duty for all citizens and uh, we can, uh, and this can greatly enhance our societies. Uh, this, is, this is a particularly true for young people and I applaud your commitment and engagement, and I'm very impressed what I have heard so far from you. 
Uh, in the Western Balkans, uh, you know that we give support to regional youth uh, cooperation office in order to empower young people and to give you access to learn about opportunities across the region. We also uh, have Western Balkans Youth Lab, uh, which is also very important, uh, not least the policy dialogue between governments, parliaments and young people. So democracy is something that lives through action and participation at all levels. I have been elected representative at local, uh, regional, national and the European level. So I'm fully convinced of this. But it is also about an approach and the mentality. It is something that we need to practice and cultivate. So uh, uh, later on, I may uh, dwell a little bit with you on the conference on the future of Europe. So this conference on the future of Europe will be the best platform for citizens' engagement and for, uh, uh, for deliberation. So I also think that uh, uh, six member states of Western Balkans and uh, your citizens uh, should have a place uh, within this conference on the future of Europe, which is established in order to narrow the gap between us politicians and uh, citizens, and uh, which uh, I am looking forward to be launched during uh, German presidency. So I also think that there is a place for uh, Western Balkans and to start uh, dialogue also uh, with you, but it's not dialogue among me and you, it's a dialogue on local, regional, national and uh, in the end uh, European level and it is also dialogue with civil society. Without civil society, without non-governmental organizations, this um, uh, this uh, the conference won't be, uh, won't be possible. So Yes, I agree with you, Mariola. Uh, civic participation is very important, and uh, and without uh, having the influence in policy making, uh, it it won't be good in Western Balkans. It doesn't mean that we are against representative democracy. We think that this that this uh, citizens' deliberations are complementary to representative democracy. So maybe later on I can say more about the conference on the future of Europe. Thanks a lot, uh, Commissioner Schwitter. Uh, uh, the, the question was also about the civic centers, uh, civic centers for education. Um, would, would you, could you maybe say something about this idea? This the idea. Yeah, yes. yeah, I heard the idea. I heard about regional network. I find it nice. We are talking about economy at the moment and the economic uh, creating common market. But why don't create network of civic centers? So I'm in favor, definitely. And I think, uh, but you have to find the best way within your own country and within the region. So uh, I, you have my full support in this. Thank you so much for this answer. Thanks a lot. Yeah, we go to the second question, which was to uh, Minister Dimitrov, who joined us, joins us from Paris, from the airport. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, it was about how to invest the money uh, of the diaspora in order to have really long-term um, sustainable investments. Yeah, please, Minister Dimitrov. Can you hear us? We cannot hear you. There is a button, maybe. Yes, yes. can Great. you hear me? Welcome. Okay, can, can you understand me speaking with the mask? Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so first of all, apologies for me looking like an astronaut, <laughs> but, I, but I have to respect the rules. And as you said, I am... Uh, joining from the Charles de Gaulle airport in, in Paris on my way back home. At the outset, I'd like to congratulate my great friend uh, Michael Roth and Minister Heiko Maas for this conference on probably the most important topic of our generation for the region. Uh, the whole region is in a race against time because we need people like we have here on my screen we need them at home so that they can, there can be prosperity. But in order for them to stay at home, we need the hope for prosperity. 
uh, in my country and uh, throughout the region. So briefly, before I go to the question on remittances versus investments, I think uh, partly we have economic uh, pull factors. Uh, unemployment is still uh, high and salaries are still, by and large, uh, much lower than uh, those in the rest of our continent, in the rest of Europe. So um, one is, do young people have enough around them to have a hope for a prosperous life? Then back to uh, inclusiveness and democracy, I think what What's another push factor is um, whether they can have uh, equal opportunities, that is meritocracy versus clientelism, and whether they can compete with their capabilities and, and their education in a system that works. Education here is extremely important. And I think probably the most urgent need in this field is to take PISA test seriously the whole region uh, is not doing very well when it comes to primary education in particular, understanding and basic mathematics. So I think we need to focus on that and maybe prepare roadmaps, what it is that we can do to create results in this key uh, area. Then I think we also need to tackle uh, air pollution and the issues of, in, of, of the environment. And I am quite encouraged that uh, in the newest investment plan of the European Commission, uh, there is a plan and there are European funds in, by way of grants to start getting rid of the coal plants that are really creating uh, pollution throughout the region. I think most of the biggest polluters in Europe are actually in, in the Balkans in terms of uh, coal power plants. Uh, so, um, now, back to this question, and by the way, I cannot uh, resist the temptation to quote Minister Mas, who in his introductory speech said, either the EU will come to them or they will come to us. And uh, I think this is the choice that both the EU and our region will need to make. And this is not only in terms of formal membership. It is more importantly on bringing the European way of life, principles and rules at home. This is what we need to do. And for that, we need a working, functional, strict and fair accession process. And we need young people like this to, to tell us what we do uh, wrong. Uh, remittances and investments. I think, um, Remittances help in the short term, but uh, of obviously investments of, of the migration from the region are much more important and would be much more useful. There are sporadic positive cases where uh, people who left uh, made their money abroad, uh, got back and invested. There are a few cases that I know of in, in North Macedonia, but far from enough. And I think the reasons why we don't see this more has to do with uh, predictability, perspective, rule of law, uh, trust of these people that they can invest and the investments will be safe and secure and they will make a profit. Uh, you asked me where should I start? I think by being uh, vocal, by being loud, probably finding a few good examples. In, uh, you, you called us from, from Belgrade, so when it comes to Serbia, Serbs who left and, they are, and are now back as entrepreneurs, as, as uh, businessmen investing in the country. And maybe you should find people who tried and didn't do it and then start a public debate about the issues. I don't think this is an, there is an easy fix on this. I only know uh, I am. I, I recently turned 48. I was 18 when 
at that time, Macedonia, today North Macedonia, became independent. And I know that the, the task of my generation to give the next one better opportunities and a better start to the one that we had back in uh, 1991 and the early 90s is not yet accomplished. I know that we don't have too much time in, at our hands. And I know that as a region, we have to start to compete and cooperate on things that matter. We talked about education. We talked about uh, environment. I think we need to compete also on where the media are most free, where the judiciary is the most independent, and where there is digitalization and where there is innovation. I think if we start a competition on the things that matter, in a matter of few years, with the help of the European Union, we can bring Europe in, in the Balkans. I'll stop here. Thank you, Minister Dimitrov. <laughs> Thank you for the answer. Yeah, we will continue with uh, Samia Beharic uh, from Bosnia-Herzegovina. He's a board member of the Western Balkans Alumni Association, and he recently graduated from the University of Vienna and Leipzig. And he was doing a research about the influence of foreign scholarship programs on brain circulation. Yeah, um, Mr. Beharic, please, can you uh, tell us more about uh, education and regional student mobility, please. Absolutely. Thank yours. you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Wolfo, for your, uh, for your introduction. Thank you also to um, others who spoke before, who will spoke after. Um, well, very good question. I mean, during the last seven years, um, I have studied um, and worked in seven countries across three continents. And every time I would go abroad, either to study or to do my traineeship, I would return, I would come back. Um, and this was also the case just like 10 months ago when I returned from my traineeship in, in, in the European Parliament in Brussels. And nothing of this uh, would, be, uh, would be possible without institutional and financial help uh, provided by the European Commission and German government, um, which invested in my higher education more actually than my own uh, homeland, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, during my exchange, there's a funny story. During my exchange, um, exchange semester at the Free University of Berlin uh, back in 2013, um, I met two people with whom I became really, really close friends. Um, Dushica and Sahit they were both um, Erasmus students uh, with whom I built really long lasting friendship. And um, Dushita, a Belgrade native, um, she taught me how to write a perfect CV back in Berlin. And Sahit, on the other hand, he comes from Pristina. Uh, he helped me to learn how to cook and how to make my mom proud and how to survive Erasmus for these um, two semesters there. Um, and seven years later, today, uh, meeting my Erasmus friend Dushica and Sahit is, is meeting my friend Dushica basically is easy. It's only one bus ride away to Belgrade. Um, however, meeting Sahit is a nightmare. Not because we're not friends anymore, uh, but because every time I need to go to Pristina, to Kosovo, I have to go through this painstaking Kafkaesque basically process of obtaining um, a tourist visa from for, for Kosovo because I am a Bosnian citizen. And this is deeply disturbing and troubling for every Bosnian citizen, especially for young people. Um, Erasmus may has brought us together, but the current visa regime between Bosnia and Kosovo is separating us current, currently. And it was this year um, that the world has celebrated the 33rd um, anniversary of Erasmus Plus program. Uh, back in 1987, um, since 1987, this program has helped, um, has helped that more than 10 million people from the whole world study abroad, learn new languages, and meet, basically. And there is a research that says that a third of all Erasmus students have a partner uh, with a different nationality. So can you believe that? And there is an additional study, which is, which is really um, uh, one of my favorites. It says from these Erasmus relationships, there were 1 million babies born. Some of them also in the Western Balkans. Uh, but all of these students from the Balkans who met at Erasmus, they basically met at a neutral ground. So there is a question, um, why can't we all meet basically in the Western Balkans too? Well, currently, that seems almost like a mission impossible. And believe it or not, for me, while I was studying at the University of Sarajevo, 
um, it was for me, it was easier to go for an exchange semester in Russia, in Turkey, in China, more easier than, I, than going to the University of Belgrade in Serbia to spend this one semester. And this is not just, you know, it, it, it's not just, um, it, this is not because we don't want to mingle and exchange within the region. We want students, young people. It's because there are no funds and strategic programs that allow us to do so. And this really has to change. Um, Erasmus Plus program has brought more Bosniaks, Croats, Serbs, Albanians and Montenegrins, Macedonians, more than any other program combined since the, since the dissolution of Yugoslavia. And I would say that it is integrated education and trans-border research activities, um, mingling of young people within the region. This is something that helps us break prejudice and build long lasting relations among ourselves, among the youth. And this should be the highest imperative, I would say, uh, for, our, for our generations. During the last 13 weeks, you said it yourself, um, I worked together with 11 amazing people from the Western Balkans, preparing this paper that um, you will be able to read online. One of the main elements and one of my favorite elements of the paper, one of the, one of the recommendations of the paper is that Western Balkan governments, together with the EU should expand joint degree programs between the EU and within the Western Balkans. And this would, this would absolutely increase the intra-regional mobility within the Western Balkans. However, there is a small problem. There is no intra-regional mobility in the Western Balkans without the EU member states taking a step and allowing visa-free travel between Kosovo and EU states, and at the same time, for Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo to mutually abolish the visa regime that currently prevents young people to travel uh, between each other. And just to conclude, basically today we live in a moment where the EU action is needed much, much more than ever before. And this is not just for me to make it easier for me to um, visit my friend Sahit uh, in Pristina. This is about fostering and building relationship, long lasting relationship between the young people in the region. Without the young people in the Western Balkans, I truly believe there is no united Western Balkans in the long run. And this is what we aim for and strive for. And in that light, I would have a, I would have a question for uh, Minister Roth. Um, it will be related again to, to um, visa liberalizations and visa regimes. Mr. Roth, um, would Germany be ready as part of its um, EU presidency uh, to encourage European Commission to provide financial, both financial and technical support to increase the intra-Western Balkans mobility scheme of young people and especially university students? And secondly, would Germany be interested in initiating facilitation of enabling visa-free travel between Kosovo and Bosnia and Herzegovina? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Beharic, very much for this vivid uh, contribution. Many greetings to Yaitse. We will, uh, before answering this question, we will go to Exona Bokshi. She is uh, from Kosovo, I think from Pristina. <laughs> very much welcome. She is engaged in empowering youth in a, in a project which is funded by the UN Secretary's uh, General's Peace Building Fund called Empowering Youth for a peaceful, prosperous, and sustainable future in Kosovo. And she also coordinated a mentorship program within uh, United Nations volunteers. Um, Mrs. Bok, she will now talk about the debate for the future of Europe and the engagement of the Western Balkans, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the, for the introduction and for the for the chance and the opportunity to, to share our uh, insights and, and, and problems. Uh, it is funny, I mean, I come from a country that actually hold, holds two European records. One is actually quite positive, but, but the other one is actually definitely negative and has a dooming impact on Kosovo's future. 53% of the population in Kosovo are in the age under 25, and Kosovo has the youngest population in Europe, but yet, yet uh, fifty percent of the people, uh, young people in Kosovo, are uh, unemployed. And according to some studies and, and, and research, 
one in two people in Kosovo are willing to leave the country and basically migrate uh, to Europe. As, as we are speaking and, and as we can see right now, the problems that the region entirely have are not just one and are not just that simple, are problems that are, are, are complex, are, are complex problems. And it's not just about young people trying to leave or trying to stay. But yet we young people in the region, when we see and try to find solutions for these problems, we are usually voiced only in, in a regional level. And in my perspective, I think this regional perspective of giving voice to our solutions is, I think, is lacking. We are living in the times of pandemic, global warming and mass migration. And I think we need to understand that the problems that we are facing, not only as a region, they demand for, for, they demand for an approach and for solutions that go basically beyond national borders and beyond regional borders as well. But yet, I am concerned that every time we speak for the future of Europe, sort of Western Balkans are not included, and yet we are seen or considered to be or to become Europeans. One tangible, uh, one tangible problem that I think uh, uh, Mr. Dimitrov as well mentioned was the, the, the environmental problems and pollution problems that we have. Actually, eight of out of 10 most polluted power plants that we have in Europe are actually located in the Western Balkans. So you have this additional harmful pollution that it's traveling to EU uh, that it's coming from the Western Balkans. What I'm trying to say is that the problems that we are facing, they are huge problems, but they need to have an ambitional people who can work on that. And we need uh, politicians from the both sides, regional and European uh, politicians to work together. Young people in the Western Balkans are losing the trust when they see when when we talk about us as, as Europeans. For good or for 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 wrong for wrong reasons maybe and and, and good reasons uh, for us Europe seems to be like a like a distant destination and in my perspective it shouldn't be like this we should work together to this European values that we have I feel Kosovar as much as I feel European I am attached to the Balkans for the values and traditions that we share this is the place where I was born. And, uh, and this is the place, the Balkans were basically the place where all my fellow panelists were born. However, the values that we share, the youth from the region are the same values that our peers in Europe have. So equality, tolerance are, are values that we as well share. And we want to see our societies progress towards the European Union. My message today is, is, is really clear. Uh, we want the young people from the young people from the region, we want to be considered uh, in or we want to have a seat on the table every time we are speaking and we are debating for the future of Europe because uh, we want to find solutions not only for the regional problems but but for the Europe as as a whole because I think and and I think all my, my fellow panelists agree uh, Europe without the Western Balkans is not complete just as EU project without the Western Balkans six is not complete either so uh, regarding to regarding to to my message, uh, my question is uh, is addressing uh, towards um, Mrs. Schuita. So uh, in your uh, European Commission portfolio, which includes demography, in June you published uh, a report on the impact on demography changes. And this report uh, brings out the major impacts and demography changes in economic growth, labor markets, and basically the needs for the public uh, finances. My question is, would you consider doing the same report with the same methodology for the Western Balkan 6 as well? In your speech uh, for the future of Europe, and I'm quoting here, the conference of the future of Europe is an excellent tool to engage and involve all Europeans. 
Can we, the youth from the Western Balkans, rely on your support and the Commission's support to include the Western Balkan Six in the Conference for the Future of Europe? Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mrs. Bokshi. Many greetings to Kosovo. We will first now go to the question of Mr. Beharic uh, to Minister of State, uh, Mr. Roth. This was about the support for um, more mobility for young people within the region, um, financial maybe, technical support. Uh, also, um, the question was about how to enable visa-free traveling between citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina and citizens of Kosovo. Please, Minister Wood. Thank you so much. And um, I feel really privileged to attend this very special panel with great guys and ladies from the region. Um, I would like to share some uh, very personal and private experiences with you. I was born in a very small village in the middle of nowhere in Germany, close to the former border to the GDR. I was a child of a workers' class family, no money, no chances. I was the first one in my family who went to university. And I'm a bit jealous. Um, I'm a bit jealous. Uh, because of your excellent language skills, your outstanding experiences, your academic background. You have so many advantages and opportunities, much more opportunities than I have had in the 90s when I went to university and made my degrees at the university. I just studied in Germany. Now, one of the biggest success stories of the European Union is the Erasmus Plus Youth Mobility Program. And this is not just a success story for the Western Balkan states. It's also, for, it's also a success story for a prosper country like Germany with a strong economy, with a stable welfare state. And it's not just about money. Money is also key. That's why my government was extremely committed to increase the money for Erasmus+. Plus. We, we, we will invest 50% more money into Erasmus Plus program, but not just for the academic elite. From my point of view, all young people should have the opportunity to participate in such a program, a youth mobility program, to overcome stereotypes, to overcome cliches. We, we are living in extremely dangerous times, not just because of the pandemic. The major threats are nationalism, and populism, racism, that is the reality. This is a fucking reality in my country. And this is also the reality in your countries. Regional reconciliation in the Western Balkans is key, and that is one of the main objectives of the so-called Berlin process, interconnectivity, mobility. It should be rather normal that you come together, that you discuss that you change, that you share your experiences, that you work not just in your home state, but also in other Western Balkan states or in Germany or in France, and that you have the chance to come back to um, build up a bright future for your own countries. So I can't agree more. Mobility is the key. And I don't like the whole discussion because it's too much focused on business and on, on economy. It's freedom and liberty is also key. Democracy, a vivid democracy needs committed Democrats. And as a committed Democrat, as a committed European, you have to feel the spirit. 
And that's why the European Union is not just a single market or not just a currency union. It is first and foremost a union of common values. And these values are an obligation for all of us, in particular to you. And now we have the problem that we have to overcome our own disputes and contro controversial discussions with respect to the rule of law. So um, I'm not quite sure if the European Union is always a role model for the Western Balkans, but at the end it's worth it to continue the Berlin process, to continue um, the extremely challenging efforts in order to um, strengthen rule of law, independence of judicial, youth mobility, to improve the education system. It's also the question if uh, Germany is a role model for you because Germany is a federal country and um, education is one of the core competences of the German states, of the German lenders. And um, for us, uh, as representatives of the national government, it's always delicate to coordinate um, uh, education uh, policy because the states, the German states, don't, don't like it really much. We just have the privilege to pay for it. But at the end, uh, the, 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 the driving forces don't, don't sit in Berlin, in the national capitals, they sit in the state capitals. In my, in, in, my, in my home state in, 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 in Germany. So I would like to encourage you to continue and to take the chances, to take the opportunities. You are the role models, uh, of not just for the Western Balkans, but also for, for the European Union. And um, so um, my, my appreciation to all of you that you accept our invitation to participate in such a conference. And I hope so you have the chance to encourage others in your home states to participate in such conferences and also in, uh, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the Erasmus Plus program. And uh, it's, it's one of our main uh, uh, objectives uh, to, 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 to do much more for visa liberalization in the region. It should be the normality for all young people, for all the citizens in the Western Balkans, that you can travel from one country to, to another. And for us, as the European Union, is, is an obligation to introduce um, visa liberalization for Kosovo, because Kosovo met all the criteria and met the conditions, which are the, pre -con which are the, 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 the basis for such a decision. But um, the times are rather difficult, and so we have to convince others in the Council uh, to, 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 to send a green light to Kosovo. Yeah, thanks a lot for this energetic uh, response and also the support. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, the support for uh, for visa liberalization for Kosovo. Yeah, the next uh, question was to Mrs. Schuiter. It was about the uh, report on demographic change and if the same report could also be done uh, with the same methodology uh, for the Western Balkans. Please, Mrs. Schuiter. Thank you for this question. Uh Zona, but before answering directly to this question, let me, uh, let me, uh, uh, Minister Ross inspired me a little bit. So the topic of Western Balkans is very close to my heart and uh, I have experienced the war in the region myself. And uh, I have seen how thereafter my home country built its independence and democracy on the path towards uh, the European Union. So your destiny is also of great importance to me. And throughout uh, my entire life in politics, I have uh, strongly focused on development in the region, especially uh, here at European level. As a member of European Parliament, I was vice chair uh, of the Foreign Affairs Committee and vice chair of the delegation for relations with Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo and have been really vocal. I have voted two or three times for visa liberalization uh, for Kosovo, but it never passed in European Council. This was the problem. So I really cannot understand that this is a problem, but this is a problem. So we have to influence, uh, influence uh, the uh, heads of states and, uh, and uh, uh, prime ministers to finally endorse this visa liberalization for Kosovo. So uh, in my role as MEP, so I visited, therefore, almost all Western Balkan countries officially, some even more than once. I visited Pristina many times. So uh, not only are we 
all faced by this health crisis and the economic and social impacts it will have. But we are, all, all, um, we, we are, we are also facing many of the same underlying causes in the field of demographic change, and uh, this is a relation predicted. Um, this is a relation um, on predicated on core European values, and of course we look for, forward to consolidating this even further. So, European Union has been the best friend, the best partner, and supporter of the Western Balkans. I'm sh I can uh, quote you: European Union without Western Balkan is not complete. I'm sure we cannot leave this hole in the West, in in the in European in the heart of European Union. So I think we have shown this on many occasions and proved uh, it. We proved it during current crisis and also vice versa. Uh, we are touched by the support offered by some Western Balkans governments to European Union member states. And this is also why we believe that uh, uh, as we prepare ourselves to launch a reflection on the present and future of Europe, we must ensure that the countries of Western Balkans find a place in this exercise. This is not to be determined today during this dialogue, but it is something to be uh, to be. Uh, born in mind. You mentioned demographic uh, first uh, ever demography report. You know that this is first ever portfolio on demography in European Commission and uh, President Ursula von der Leyen assigned uh, me with this uh, portfolio which is very important because we saw it's the problem of whole Europe and also of Western Balkans. We share the same problems, we share the same values and uh, on 17th of June, the Commission adopted a report on impact of demographic change. And this report identifies main trend, trends and addresses the possible impacts of demographic change. So we know that the main uh, trends are longer life expect expectancy, fewer births, uh, aging population, smaller households, and of course, uh, uh, more mobile Europe and changing population size. So, uh, if I may tell you only one example, we live in last 50 years, we live, we Europeans on average, we live 10 years more. So, we have to uh, anticipate this uh, in our policies. Regarding your, your question, uh, in, uh, in this report, in this report, we recognize that it is important that to take into account what happens also in our neighborhood and the world at large. So the broad demographic trends that we can observe in European Union are similar to those in Western Balkans, for example. So there is not uh, uh, much difference. At this moment, I have to answer directly, we are not planning to draw up a similar report on the Western Balkans, but we do look closely at the developments in the region and monitoring done by others, such as European Union Population Fund. So they published recently, for example, a report on depopulation as a global challenge and zoomed in on the situation, for example, in Serbia. So, uh, of course, we will, uh, we will uh, uh, closely monitor, as I said. But uh, uh, once again, I have to reiterate the Conference of the Future Europe. It is intended as a reflection on what our citizens want for, from Europe, but of course the countries of the Western Balkans are part of that future, both by aspiration, but also by history and geography. So the Commission is open to consider how best to devise the involvement of the Western Balkans, our close European neighbors in the Conference on the Future of Europe. So the pandemic has demonstrated the extent to which European member states and other countries in Europe, including Western Balkans, depend on each other and how we need to work together. So uh, if I may reiterate the, the Western Balkans, EU Western Balkans summit on 6th of May under uh, Croatian presidency, the Commission acknowledged that the partners of the Western Balkans will need to find their place in our forthcoming reflection on the future of Europe. So decision is uh, decision on this is not on the Commission alone. The overall structure and governance of the conference are still to be agreed. 
uh, still to be agreed among uh, three institutions, Parliament, uh, Council and Commission. Since we have uh, Ms. Mad uh, Minister Roth here, I'm sure that the Council will take this into consideration and I'm sure that there is a lot of com uh, in common and there are many fields like security, energy, climate change, which are also relevant for Western Balkans. You mentioned the environmental and pollution problems. I know about this. I know that, uh, that, that this is also a problem. So we strongly believe that the citizens should be able to discuss in the Conference of the Future of Europe the topics that matter most to them. And uh, this is also important uh, when we, uh, if I may reiterate, uh, if, if I may come back to the first question uh, put uh, by Mariola, so this is also uh, a, uh, this is also a question of civic engagement. We need to involve the citizens and hear to them. Among six uh, priorities, uh, among six headline priorities of this commission, I could imagine that in particular the twin transitions. So the green transition and digital transition are of great interest for people uh, peoples of Western Balkans. Uh, in the context of this terrible pandemic. We get a lot of questions and interest in health policies from citizens everywhere. And I'm sure that uh, health will be on top of the agenda of our citizens. But again, citizens, also citizens of Western Balkans, should be free to raise the topics they are, that are of concern to them. And we want to hear from them. So uh, this was a little bit broader answer, but definitely uh, we take uh, whatever you said into consideration. At the moment, we are not planning to draw up a similar report on the Western Balkans, but let's mm -hmm. uh, maybe I can see with the uh, with Commissioner Raheli, and we can uh, we can uh, we can deliberate on this. Yeah, thanks a lot for the support, Commissioner Schulze. The next uh, presentation uh, comes from Nina Trakulic from Montenegro. Nina Trakulic uh, graduated from Faculty of Electrical Engineering um, in Montenegro, and she's currently working as a telecommunications engineer at the international company Roaming Network. And she founded a very interesting NGO, it's called Montenegro Botics, and uh, she wants to gather and equip young and talented students with the aim to improve knowledge in the field of science and robotics. So please, Nina Trakulic, uh, can you tell us more about digitalization? And um, yeah, please, the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for this uh, wonderful introduction. I'm really honored to be part of uh, this uh, conference. And also, I have to say uh, great work for my uh, team. I hope uh, one day we will meet all uh, live somewhere. Uh, in the last few years, we have witnessed an increasing number of young people who are leaving the country of origin. As I'm coming from the engineering world, the world of technology and science, I would like to share my personal opinion on how these fields can help Western uh, Balkan countries to develop at a higher pace and keep young intellectuals and talented people from going abroad. Four years ago, our robotic journey started when we received a call to participate in an Olympic style robotics challenge, first global challenge. We couldn't imagine that uh, this uh, journey will open doors to great scientific ideas. First Global invites uh, one team from every country to participate in the international robotics event that builds bridges between high school students with different backgrounds, languages, religions, and customs. It is held in a different nation each year from Washington, DC, Mexico City, Dubai, and this year, unfortunately, online because of pandemic situation. My colleague and I, as a coordinator and mentor, uh, we decided to uh, form each year a new team so uh, we can uh, face with the world's grand challenges and find solutions for uh, polluted water, how to use renewable energy uh, for medicine, etc. From uh, this experience, we learned how to work with each other, trust each other and become part of truly global community. This led us to found an engineering organization, NGO Montenegro Robotics, devoted to robotics and smart system technologies development. 
Our goal is to continuously gather young enthusiasts who by studying and applying scientific and technological inventions want to contribute to a better life of our society and environment. In this pandemic uh, period, we have seen how important the digitalization really is and how much we have to work on its development. Today, the term digitalization has a broad meaning. Digitalization is that your mobile phone can replace your paper city map, for example, and, uh, or that you can enter the app on your phone instead of entering the bank building when you pay your monthly bills. Digitalization is also the fact that information that was once deeply hidden in the archives is now available to you in just a few seconds. Digitalization is all that computers can do for, uh, for us and we must learn to take advantage of it. As uh, Mr. Dimitrov and Exoda said about air pollution, elevated level of air pollution are one of the four most common causes of health problems and mortality in the world. According to the World Health Organization, who 43% of lung diseases as well as the 25% of heart attacks occurred as a result of increased air pollution. Also in the WHO and the EU reports from 2018, uh, the countries of the Western Balkans, including Montenegro, are among the five countries with the most polluted air in the Europe. Uh, maybe we have some solution for that and I will share with you information about uh, our product called ECOMAR. ECOMAR is an ecological monitoring and reporting system. It is conceived as the first Montenegrin product in a concept of smart city intended for environmental monitoring. That is a product of a modern industrial design, contains measuring sensors, electronic components to collect and send data, as well as web platforms and data visualization application. The applications uh, of, the, of uh, our products are numerous. We were guided by the idea it is necessary to raise awareness of society as a whole about the importance of preserving the environment and improving air quality, which unfortunately isn't currently an idea at an adequate level. I believe that uh, smart cities are the present and the future, and as such, they attract investment and stimulate economic growth. Smart cities and the countries attract young and creative people, which would result in the creation of multidisciplinary teams that can make an outstanding contribution to the creative and accelerated development of the West Balkan countries. Uh, my opinion that uh, investing in these can fields you? is is uh, please to your question <laughs> uh, investing in these fields is one crucial step to keep young talented people from going abroad regarding this topic i have a question for mr dimitrov about the eu economic and investment plan and in particular its parts on the uh, digitalization do you think it provides enough financial and technical support uh, for western balkans to bridge the gap with the eu and second do you see political readiness across the region to work towards closing that, that gap thank you um, thank you so much, Mrs. Trakulic. Since Minister Dimitrov was already looking on his clock, I think it might be better that he is directly answering this question. Minister Dimitrov, uh, the question was about technical support for the Western Balkans to bridge the gap when it comes to digitalization. And um, yeah, please, can you maybe add something to this? Thank you. Okay. Am I unmuted? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, um, and are you any more? Can you try again? We don't hear you anymore. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay. So, and in a matter of months, uh, in Greece, uh, they did really good things in digitalizing services, uh, public services for the citizens. I think we can really do a lot with digitalization. First of all, it's a way to fight corruption. It's a way to make uh, public administration more efficient, more accessible, faster, providing services to, to, to citizens. Then, uh, it 
opens up a huge space for uh, economic development. And uh, when Commissioner Varhey was in the region, he talked about connecting the capitals of the region with highways and railways. And the third thing he mentioned was making sure that we have uh, infrastructure in the region for broadband uh, uh, internet. So uh, I think it's not so much a matter of funds. I think there, there are funds for it, for that through this investment plan as well. It's a matter of focus and how do we get ourselves better organized to actually start doing things. Um, we really have to focus more on, on digitalization. This is not exactly in my portfolio, but I was so inspired. What, what they did was they readjusted the Estonian model for the circumstances, sort of tailoring uh, their model for and applying it for Greece. And I think we can all replicate that and the benefits will be uh, throughout the field. Um, so the funds are there, the need is there. It, it's a matter of focus and uh, organization. Okay, thanks a lot for this answer. The next and the last presentation comes from Tomica Stojanovic. He is from North Macedonia. And he's a language and cultural facilitator and was also working at uh, the youth organization Mlad in Four. And uh, he's also a social media assistant. Uh, since uh, September this year, he is enrolled at the Democracy and Human Rights Program at the University of Sarajevo. So many greetings to Sarajevo. Please, Mr. Sojanoviki, um, uh, please your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening from uh, Sarajevo. Um, it's a pleasure to, to be part of this panel with uh, all of you and especially with uh, us, uh, the young people representing the whole Western Balkans tonight. Um, all my life I've been involved in a way in the civic society sector. However, in 2016, I kind of Kind of intensified that and started taking part and organized meetings in the topic of brain drain in Macedonia where that was discussed with a lot of young people. I've heard opinions from a lot of young people, from students, uh, from high school students, and they were explaining why they wanted to leave the region and go to dominantly Western European countries. Most of them were disappointed with the situation in, in, their, uh, in the country, with the lack of jobs, with the captured public institutions and media, failing public and failing public policies. However, they, they also felt a, a hopelessness. They were feeling hopeless just because they were convinced that the things could not change soon enough. In particular, that was the name issue that we had with Greece back then. And many of them told me that the name issue persisted only because the EU didn't want our country to be part of the union which I very push strongly again that, that against the statement and argue that our issue with Greece did not emerge as a part of a, our EU accession process. But it in fact started in the chaos of the early 1990s when the Cold War ended and there was the fall of the European and global order and emerged in a way within the, the United Nations, that whole issue. And I, and I also argued that actually the, Euro, the European Union process can actually help to solve it and argued that for many years, my colleagues, my family and, and friends. And then I was stand firmly against that statement that when solving that name issue, we are gonna continue throughout the European path and become a member of the European Union. In 2018, leaders of my country, one of them being Mr. Dimitrov, who is with us uh, today in this panel, who had a growing internal maturity and the help of the friends of the United of the European Union, the United States, we finally managed to resolve the name issue with Greece. And as many of my friends and family will remember, that was not an easy step to take for us. However, that we kind of felt the same kind of hope, a hope that finally we're getting out of the limb and that we're continuing throughout the European Union path and the accession. However, with the French objection uh, in 2000. Uh, uh, with the French objection of the of the uh, network uh, of the accession framework, it seemed that uh, that road's not going to be easy as we all expected. However, I also argued back then that the Fr the French had some actually nice points there because we've seen some frameworks before that who did not give us really good results. 
for example, the frameworks that are currently used in Serbia and Montenegro. Um, so better accession methodology for North Macedonia and Albania would definitely be helpful in that point. So we're now in 2020 with the name issue behind us and the new methodology in place. However, there is a new obstacle emerging and coming from our Eastern neighbor, Bulgaria. And it's one questioning the language we speak, which I can honestly not understand, to be honest. And unlike the name issue, which was purely political and emerged in the chaos in the 1990s, and this one goes, in fact, against that issue. And it seems that it's emerging connected to the, uh, to the European accession of our country in particular. And honestly, in my opinion, it goes against so many core European values. That's been shared by a lot of my colleagues who are experts in the field, not just in North Macedonia, but throughout the region in Europe. And I'm comfortable that other European member states, including Germany, will stand up and defend EU values and principles to prevent any other attempts to turn the EU accession process into a process where issues that go against the core European values and principles are created and championed. So my question in, in, in all that, uh, on those points that I just said, goes to Mr. Roth, who we just saw by his speech on his response to summer is a true friend of a more liberal, democratic and prosperous Western Balkans that are closer to the European Union. Mr. Roth, am I right to expect that in this emerging issue with Bulgaria for the European Union and the majority of its member states will stand strongly and defend the European principles and values in the Western Balkans? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Please, Minister Roth. Thank you so much. And I fully understand your impatience, your worries, your concerns. Um, transformation is extremely challenging for common people, in particular for the young generation. Um, that's why we changed the methodology of the whole enlargement process. And that brings our distinguished friends in the Western Balkans sometimes in a very, very delicate situation. Very frankly and honestly, with respect to rule of law, our expectations to the Western Balkan states are sometimes as high as our expectations to member states of the European Union. And we all have to take into account that there are some serious problems regarding rule of law, independence of judiciary, fight against corruption, media pluralism and media freedom within the European Union. That's why the protection of the rule of law within the European Union is one of the key priorities of the German Council Presidency. And it's not so easy as it sounds. And that brings me back uh, to the Western Balkans, because I already mentioned that we changed the methodology. 10 years, 15 years ago, accession negotiations means negotiations regarding agriculture, single market, competition, fisheries, and so on. But now we put the most pressing and most important issues on the top of the negotiation agenda. Rule of law, fight against corruption, regional reconciliation. And that's extremely challenging for all of you because you have overcome long disputes and controversies and you need political leadership. That's why we need brave political leaders like Nicola to overcome such disputes. Nobody outside the region understands the complexity of these conflicts. That's why we try to be supportive in order to find sustainable solutions which are acceptable for both sides. Our key strategy is to strengthen the visibility of the European Union during the whole process. That's why we introduced the 
so-called Berlin process. During the whole process, which is a very long and bumpy road, the European Union need to be vocal. The European Union need to be visible, not just with money, but also with clear support and assistance. Combating the pandemic, for instance, climate, interconnectivity, digitalization. You can't wait 10 years or 15 years or five years because you want to build up a bright future for you, for your family, for your loved ones right now. And so we have to do much more right now. And there is another strategic approach. I don't want, I, I, I have to emphasize. If there is a political vacuum in the Western Balkans, there are other global actors on the stage which are very much interested to strengthen their influence in the region. But these global actors don't share the same values like the European Union. Turkey, Russia, China, they are talking a lot about money. They are talking a lot, a lot about national identity or religion or um, what else? But they don't talk about values like democracy, rule of law. And that's why the European Union is sometimes so, deep, so, so, so exhausting, so challenging. Because we are we focus the whole negotiations on the key elements of the EU accession process. And that's why I very much appreciate positive examples in the region. I'm very glad that we have the chance to open the accession talks uh, with Albania, with North Macedonia in the near future, if we overcome the last disputes. And um, I remain an optimist. So it's all about hope. Hope matters within the European Union and within the Western Balkans. And the problem of the European Union, that is my last point, is that we are confronted with so many crises and problems. The European Union is in a crisis mode for more than 10, 15 years. But we cannot allow that the people in the Western Balkans have to pay the bill for our problems, we have to do both. On one hand, we have to modernize, we have to strengthen uh, the European Union, we have to build up a more sovereign, a more efficient, a more capable European Union, a more resilient one. And on the other hand, we have to do our utmost best in order to strengthen the EU perspective of the Western Balkan states. The Western Balkan states are not our backyard. You are our courtyard. You belong to us. But we cannot offer political discounts with respect to the rule of law. So I, can, I fully understand your impatience. I fully understand your disappointments. But at the end, it's worth it to continue. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, I want to just shortly give the word to Minister Dimitrov since he has to leave us. Thanks a lot for your participation. Yes, okay. Thanks a lot for your participation. Can you, let, me, yeah. let me give one message uh, to yeah. the young people uh, in this virtual room. As I am at the airport, Charles de Gaulle, I'm going to quote him. And he says, I have come to the conclusion that politics are too serious a matter to be left to the politicians. So I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to say politics is not only for the politicians. And all of you, some of you are at, at, uh, in your country, some of you are in Vienna, I think I, I noticed one. Please come back, you can make a difference. Every single one of us can make a difference. And I think now is the time to make it. These next years are really critical for our region and our European future. Thank you so much for organizing this conference and uh, best wishes from me.
Thanks a lot, Minister Dimitrov, and thanks a lot, uh, Commissioner Schulze, for this uh, debate, for the, contribution, the contributions and uh, this interesting evening. And thanks a lot, lot to the young people in the Western Balkans. I heard that you want to, wanted to, to meet all in person in Tirana this year, which was not possible due to the pandemics. And I wish that you can do it next year and then that you continue with your uh, work and your cooperation in the region. Thanks a lot for everything. Thanks a lot, Minister Roth and the organizers. Have a good evening. Um, bye from Berlin. Mm.